All right, good morning, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about persistence. Uh, start with a couple of announcements. So you all know that Project 5 was due yesterday. It was meant to be pretty straightforward. I think the most complicated part was getting output to exactly match the test cases. So we're going to have to be extra, special, uh, extra careful when we do that grading to make sure that the version you think you implemented matches the version we think you're testing with. So hopefully in future semesters when we reuse that project, we will iron out all of those little glitches that you saw. Okay, project six, that is going to be available this week. You'll have the usual turnaround time to get that done. It's not going to be in the XV6 environment, so maybe that's a pleasant change of pace. Maybe you'll mix, miss XV6, I'm not sure. Um, but it's to implement this MapReduce framework, which is what Google uses and a lot of other people for data processing. And so it involves this um, highly concurrent data structure that you'll get some experience building and then adding locks to to make sure that like these mappers and these reducers uh, access that data structure atomically. All right, and then you all know that midterm two is tomorrow evening. There's a bunch of practice exams available. We'll spend discussion sections tomorrow doing review. The rooms I didn't fill in, it's the same rooms as the last exam, except discussion sections 304 and 305 will be in the smaller room, which is on the, it's like Ingraham 19, and everybody else is in the bigger room, Ingraham B10 downstairs. The test is mostly about concurrency. There'll be some questions to review virtualization. They're mostly just repeats or small phrases that have been changed from the previous midterm. There's nothing about persistence, nothing about last Thursday's lecture or today's lecture. And then the peer mentors and TAs that would have had, off, would have had lab hours will now have office hours, mostly this evening, and they'll hold that in that same room as they did last time, which is CS1207. So any questions about the midterm at this point. Same Scantron, same fill in the bubbles. All right. So today we're going to be talking about persistence. We're going to continue on into raids. So we'll be looking at what is the motivation for using more than one disk, why we want a redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks. We'll talk about a bunch of the different raid levels, raid level 0, 1, 4, and 5. We'll talk about how each RAID level does differently according to different metrics like reliability, capacity, and performance. Okay, so to recap a little bit what we were talking about last week, we've started to talk about persistence. So here we need to make sure that our files or the data that we care about um, are kept around even after we reboot the system or if there's a malicious power outage at the exact right point in time, exact wrong point in time. So we're beginning by talking about a bunch of the actual storage devices, the hardware that's out there. So last time we talked mostly about hard disks, today we're talking about RAID, and then in our next lecture we'll talk about flash or solid state devices. Uh, then we're gonna move to the top of the stack, we'll talk about what the API looks like for user applications that wanna interact with the file system. Then we'll talk about how the file system is actually implemented, what the data structures look like, how you go about allocating particular blocks to get good performance, and then we'll talk about crash recovery or really how the file system makes sure that all of its data structures remain consistent regardless of when a crash could occur. All right, so this is the basic picture we gave um, of what the hardware looks like. Um, we have our CPU where we're running our user processes and our OS. There's a high bandwidth bus to access memory. Then there are buses of lower bandwidths to access other devices that are out there like a graphics card and our IO peripheral devices out here. So the main thing to remember is just that it's a completely different resource. We can be running something on the CPU while the disk is simultaneously or concurrently working on the request that we've sent it. Those are independent um, actions and we can have multiple disks out here on this, uh, this bus as well. Whew, I need to catch my breath today. Right. So this is the disk terminology that we went over the last time uh, this disk, it rotates around a spindle. We have a number of platters. Each platter has two services, a top and a bottom. Uh, platters are divided into these con concentric rings or tracks. The stack of all the tracks is called a cylinder. The smallest amount that you can read or write is what's called a sector, which is 512 bytes. So we usually combine those sectors into blocks with, of like four kilobytes. All right, and then each of, we have a disk arm, 
and then a disk head that's activated on each surface as this disk spins around so that it can read or write individual sectors. All right, so any questions about that basic, how the disk works? The mic is working well today. All right, so basically what did we go over the last lecture? We said that the way that the file systems view a disk is a linear array of sectors from zero up to the max size of the disk. Uh, we looked at what is the I.O. time, how long does it take to do or read or write, and that had three components. There was the seek time, how long it takes to move that disk arm over the correct track. Then there was the rotation time, how long does it take for the disk to spin around and for the sector to be under the disk head that you want to read or write. And then there was the actual transfer time, which was very fast, and that's just based upon how fast the disk is spinning, how long it's going to take for you disk head to completely pass over that sector. Uh, the other main point that we saw is that sequential bandwidth is much, much greater than random bandwidth. Remember, sequential bandwidth, it's basically all transfer time, which is very fast, and random bandwidth is a factor of seek time and rotation times, which are very slow, many milliseconds. All right, and then we talked about a couple of details about disks. We talked about track skew. Remember, that's the fact that the blocks across different tracks, we have to change the addressing so that a sequential read that spans multiple tracks um, can go as fast as possible. We talked about zones, which said that we wanted a constant density of how many sectors are recorded in each track so that you end up getting better bandwidth on the outer tracks of a disk than the inner tracks. And then we were talking about buffering or caching on a disk, the fact that each track has like a track buffer. And so um, when you do a read, and you're at the right track, it, the disk starts to immediately read the contents from that surface into the track buffer so that when you do reads from that track, um, the data that you want might already be in that track buffer. And there was also caching where writes might be kept in volatile memory and then flushed out to the persistent surfaces of that disk when it was convenient. So once you have buffering, then you can start doing disk scheduling. So with this, the file system, the I.O. system that's running on the processor, sends a bunch of requests down to the disk, and the disk can reorder those requests to get the best bandwidth possible. And so there's a bunch of different scheduling algorithms. The easiest would be first come, first serve, of course. Then there's shortest seek time first. Seek time is pretty easy to approximate. You can think about that because seek time is all based on the track that you're going to. And so basically, if you just sort the sector numbers, you end up kind of scheduling by sh uh, shortest seek type first. You just go to the request that's closest to where you are right now. If you try to do something more complex like shortest positioning time first, that's taking into account both seek and rotation. The, there, the disk is trying to figure out, oh, based on how the disk is moving right now, it knows that it can seek over to another track while the disk is rotating, get a certain request, and go back and do another seek to someplace else. And it can kind of catch requests as they go by. The OS can't do anything like shortest positioning time first because the, disk, the OS does not have that low-level knowledge of exactly what's going on inside the disk, exactly how sectors are laid out across platters, and all that it would just be too low-level of knowledge to have. Then we saw there was a bunch of algorithms for dealing with starvation. So if you just do shortest seek time first, you could end up starving out requests that are far away on the disk. So there are different algorithms for dealing with that. There's this uh, elevator algorithm where the disk head just scans across the disk from the outer tracks to the inner tracks and then back again and kind of services requests as it passes by. Um, the circular scan is a slight variant of that where the disk head just only traverses in one direction. Like it only gets requests when it's going from the outer tracks to the inner tracks. Then it moves back out to the outer, and then uh, gets requests again from outer to inner. Um, and then we briefly discussed the fact that all of these algorithms were still just greedy algorithms. They're always just looking at what's the next request that would be best to do, which one will have the shortest positioning time or the shortest seek time relative to where I am right now. None of them were optimal algorithms that looked at all the combinations of requests that it, that it has in the queue right now. All right, so that's the quick race through what we covered in our previous lecture. Um, and then we were briefly talking about the fact that the disk does have an I.O. scheduler. The disk has a number of requests that it needs to handle. Now, the OS has an I.O. scheduler as well. So 
you know, the different, we have different processes running up here. Some of them are doing file operations. Some of them are paging virtual memory um, from memory out to disk. There's lots of different I.O. that needs to be accomplished. And so the OS does do some ordering of those requests. It does coalescing. It tries to find like requests that are next to one another and merge them into one bigger request. Um, but there's something else that it does that's kind of interesting. So imagine that you had two different processes, A and B, and they're each basically reading, let's imagine that A is reading from the outer tracks and B is reading from the inner tracks of this huge disk. Um, and so that A does some reading and then it does a little bit of processing. And so what's gonna happen? While A is doing that processing, um, the disk scheduler, we're gonna, so sorry, um, we, we run A, it initiates an IO request, and it blocks, right? So then the scheduler switches over to B, and it initiates a read and blocks, and then we go back to A. Now hopefully at that point, A's read is done, and A can be scheduled and do that small amount of processing. And then A will go back and do another read, which will cause it to block, and so forth. So what the disk ends up seeing are requests from A and B and A and B continually intermingled, right? And so this is going to have poor performance because now we're doing a bunch of random accesses to this disk that are very far away from each other. So what would be better is if somehow we could get all of A's requests serviced and then all of B's requests handled. But how are we going to do that? Because A needs to do a read and it needs to get the results from that before it goes off and does uh, the next read. Now the OS can do some things like prefetching where it kind of detects that A is um, doing sequential reads and it predicts accurately. If it's sequential, it's pretty easy to do. Um, and it just does a whole bunch of reads for A's process. So the OS can do prefetching. But something else that it can do is what's called anticipatory scheduling. Well, so the idea here is that we notice that um, A keeps generating new work and it would be better for the disk if we didn't tell the disk to do B's request and put only B's request in the queue. It would be better if we told the disk about A's next request so that the disk wouldn't have to do that huge disk C. So what this ends up being is an example of a non-work conserving scheduler. So in general, we've been looking at work conserving schedulers, which mean that if there's any work to do in the system, it's a good idea to do that work, right? We don't wanna keep a resource idle. We never said, oh, we're going to keep the CPU idle and not do anything. It's usually better to do something. But this is a case where it's better for the disk to actually be idle and wait until A's next request arrives rather than going off and doing this huge seek to handle B if A is going to soon initiate a request back to where the disk head was in the past. So um, you might end up seeing this word, word in other contexts that this is a non-work conserving scheduler. It's anticipatory, it keeps a resource idle um, so that it can end up having better requests to handle in the future than what it would have had if it looked at what was only there right now. So it kind of anticipates what's going to happen in the future, keeps itself idle, and then it knows it can then handle another request from A that will be nearby where the disk head is rather than doing that long seek to B. All right, so any questions about that? Okay, so we're gonna keep this pretty brief, summarize that. What we basically saw is that we wanna overlap I.O. and CPU. We can do that by using interrupts. We can do that using that direct memory access, that DMA, so that the CPU didn't have to be uh, involved with every transfer of data from the host memory and the device. This DMA engine was able to do some of that transfer for us. The other thing we saw is that uh, all storage devices or most storage devices, every storage device we're gonna look in this class is going to provide a block interface. And that's just a consistent interface that all devices will adhere to. And so it'll be transparent to the OS what type of block devices is actually attached to the machine. Uh, we saw you shouldn't do random IO. And these are slow devices, mechanical devices, so it makes sense to spend some time to actually figure out what's the best process or the best request to schedule because they're such expensive operations. All right, so that was a quick summary. Now we're gonna get on to today's lecture. Okay. All right, so today we are talking about RAID. What is RAID? So 
In our previous lecture, we looked at just having a single hard drive, a single disk. But sometimes we want to have more than that. There's a variety of reasons why you want, might want to have more than one disk on your machine. You might need more capacity. You might need more re reliability. You might want to be able to work when that one disk fails. Um, and maybe you want higher performance, that you want to be able to read at a higher throughput or get better uh, performance with multiple disks. Um, but the problem is that most file systems assume that linear array of blocks like we were talking about in the last lecture. So we somehow have to give that interface to the file system that's running on top of this disk. Now one solution is to not provide any interface and to just like mount a different file system on every disk or every partition that you have out there across these disks. And so this is called just a bunch of disks. And the idea is we're gonna have a different file system uh, mounted on each of the disks. And then when the application wants to read or write a file, it will know which file system that is. It knows how the directory structure is organized so that it can direct, you know, that you'll put like slash temp on one um, disk. Maybe you'll put your home directory on another disk. You'll put your experimental data on another. And so they'll all have different file names that will allow you to access those. So this works. Um, we'll talk about the APIs to support this a little bit more in a future lecture, um, but it's not like the most elegant solution, clearly, and it's not going to port very well when you have different numbers of disks or different setups here. So this is not what we want to do. What we want to do is what's called RAID. So RAID stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks or Redundant Array of Independent Disks. People use that both terms. Um, and what's just really, really elegant here because the file system is going to think that it has just one large disk that it's running on top of. It's going to have just one large linear array of blocks that it's reading and writing to, and there's going to be some mapping from these individual disks to that linear array. And so it's going to look like we have a large disk that has great capacity, great performance, and uh, suitable reliability. And it's awesome because it's completely transparent. The file system will not know how many actual hard drives are within this RAID system and it's just really easy to deploy out there. So let's figure out how to do this. Okay, so one argument is, well, why do we actually wanna use inexpensive disks? Why do we wanna have a bunch of cheap disks instead of just buying one really expensive disk? So the idea here is that uh, with RAID, we're able to leverage commodities of scale. So it's generally much, much cheaper to produce components that lots and lots of people buy. Right, we, we are able to figure out how to manufacture those. And if most consumers buy that one smaller, cheaper device, it will become even cheaper. Whereas if we try to have a really high-end device that's the fastest one that has the most capacity, that tends to really cost a premium to purchase. So we wanna use the cheapest devices that we can and use multiple ones of them and figure out how to get them all working together and figure out how to handle all the errors that they might generate. Okay. So the basic idea here is our RAID device is going to look like it's a linear array of blocks, just like an individual disk did, and then we're going to have some mapping from that linear array of blocks down to the individual disk beneath it. And the, we're both, mostly gonna be talking about how should we actually do that mapping today. Okay, so let's think about how we might wanna do this mapping from the logical blocks that the file system sees to the physical blocks that are actually on each of those individual disks. So you could think of this as being kind of similar to virtual memory, right? We had the same problem there where we had to go from a virtual page to a physical page. Now we're kind of going from a logical block address to a physical block address. So when we did this with virtual memory, it was pretty complicated, right? It was, we had a table that told us, you know, we had a page table that tracked this mapping because that mapping was dynamic. At runtime, we determined where a virtual page lived in physical memory. So that was, it involved this extra access, it involved all of these updates, it was pretty complicated. We're gonna do something much simpler here because we don't need as much flexibility as we did for virtual memory. With RAIDs, we're just gonna have a static mapping. So we're just going to use simple arithmetic to figure out how to go from a logical block number to a physical block number and the arithmetic will just be slightly different depending upon how many disks we have and the actual RAID level that we're implementing. Okay, so um, another thing we're gonna do in addition to having just simple mappings is we're going to have redundancy. So when we have more disks, it's more likely that one of them will fail 
just with probabilities there, if you had a thousand disks and they all have independent failures, it becomes more and more likely that you'll have at least one failure the more disk you have. So it's going to become important to have multiple copies of our data across different physical disks. So in this picture here, it looks like this data from 0 to 100 is replicated or copied across two disks, and then the data from 100 to 200 is replicated or, co or copied across those two disks. So we'll look at different replication strategies as well. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out, well, how many copies should we actually keep for every logical block? And so certainly in general, the more copies you have, um, it's definitely going to improve your reliability, but the interplay with performance is really, really complex. So sometimes it's better, it improves your performance to have multiple copies, right? So why would it improve your performance to have multiple copies? Yeah. It could be faster to access one of the copies than the other, right? So, and for what types of operations would that work well? There's a high level, th just with reads then, if you're reading two data, if you're reading the same data item and it's copied on two disks and you're saying like if the disk head is closer to the one, the sector on one of those disks than the other, you do much better to read it on the, the disk where the disk head is closer to that sector. That's great. So that for reads, uh, redundancy can definitely improve performance. But for writes, it can often decrease performance because then you're always going to be running at the rate of the slowest disk there, right? If we have to update both copies with this redundant data and wait until they're both finished to make sure everything's consistent, we're going to run at the rate of the slowest disk there. And there's going to be other, lots of other complications for writes as well that we'll get to. Okay. And then clearly, as we have more copies, we're going to hurt space efficiency since we have multiple copies. Okay, so in this lecture, the way we're going to talk about RAID is we're going to go over four different RAID levels. There's RAID level 0, 1, 4, and 5 that we'll talk about. And yes, I can count correctly. 2 and 3 are just systems that nobody uses and are, they just don't make any sense given to current technology. Um, so we'll look at 0, 1, 4, and 5. And then we're going to look at a bunch of different workloads. We've seen that random and sequential behave very, very differently. And then we'll look at reads and writes as well, because that's going to be performed very differently on RAIDs. And then we'll have a bunch of different metrics, um, capacity, reliability, and performance. OK, so the first question is, how should we actually map those logical blocks to specific physical blocks on disk? Um, so we'll start looking at RAID level 0. And then we're going to look at a bunch of different workloads. We'll have reads and writes. We'll look at sequential and random. And then we have our metrics that I was talking about. And so specifically, we'll figure out how much capacity is now available to higher levels given a number of disks. And we'll keep all of this uh, generic, formulaic. So we'll do all of our calculations in terms of like how many disks are in our RAID, which is n. Uh, what's the capacity of a single disk, which will be c. So you can think of that as it's about 500 gigabytes if you want to think about a number. Um, then we'll figure out uh, like what's our sequential throughput using this RAID based on S, which is the sequential throughput for one disk, R, the random throughput of one disk, figure out the system random throughput, and then D is the latency. All right. Okay, so let's look at our first RAID level, which is also called striping. So this is the easiest approach. We always start with the easiest approach and we make it more complicated. So this has no redundancy, no multiple copies at all. So this is what the linear array looks like to the file system that's running on top. It sees logical blocks 0 through 7. And then we need to map those blocks to each of the disks that we're running on. And in this example, we'll just have two disks. And so logical block 0 will map to block 0 on disk 1. Logical block 1 will map to offset 0 on, sorry. That was disk zero, this is disk one. Two goes back to here, three goes over here, and so forth. So we're just going to stripe or kind of round robin or alternate where each of these logical blocks is placed across these disks here. So another way that we like to look at this is that you could imagine these are the physical blocks on each of the disks, 
Uh, this is the zeroth offset, then the first offset, second offset, third offset. And then the contents here are telling us what logical block number is allocated there. So logical block zero is the zeroth location on disk zero, and then one and two and three and four. So it's just simple striping across those disks. Striping, RAID zero. And so this is what the picture looks like with four disks. We're just striping or kind of alternating where those blocks go across disks. And so ter some terminology, we call this a stripe. It's the one block from each of the disks that are all at the same offset, but that'll be useful terminology, especially as we get into other RAID levels. So to emphasize that there is simple math um, to figure out which, like, so given a logical address A that the file system wants to generate and read or write, you can calculate the disk where you need to send your request to as part of the RAID controller, and then the offset within that actual disk to read. So spend the minute and come up with the simple math formula to do that computation. All right, so if I tell you I want to read logical block number 0, 4, 8, or 12, that should map to disk 0. If I tell you I want to read logical block number 1, 5, 9, or 13, that should map to disk 1. So what's the simple function that calculates that? Mumble a math function for me as a group. Module, that mod, yes. So the disk number is the logical address mod the disk count. So 0, 4, 8, and 12, mod 4 is all 0. These mod 4 is 1, so forth. And then the offset is simply the logical block number divided integer division by the disk count. So uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 divided by 4 is all going to be 0. It's the zeroth offset. 4 through 7 divided by 4 is 1. That would be the first offset. So very simple arithmetic to figure out the correct disk number and block number within a disk given a logical block number. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, no, so real systems are a little bit more complex than this, and we'll just ignore this. Uh, what we've assumed here is that we have what's called a chunk size of 1, but um, in general, it would be inefficient to read just like one sector of 512 bytes or one block of four kilobytes per disk. We want to have like a larger unit of transfer for each disk. So the RAID system will combine multiple blocks into what it will call a chunk. Uh, you could have a chunk size of one block or two blocks or four or eight. Uh, and then um, all of the arithmetic would be based upon these chunks, but we are going to ignore that, but you might see that some other time if you look into RAIDs in more detail. We'll just assume a chunk size of one to keep this simple. All right, oh, a visualization. Awesome. Okay. So we have this little disk simulator, and this is a system with four disks, and it's with RAID level zero, so we're striping. This is the logical block number uh, allocated to each disk. And then this little black box is showing where the disk head is on each disk. And then up here, we're going to have a sequence of operations to read. And I don't think I can make this bigger, no. Okay, so let's run this tiny little simulation where we just wanna read block 56, does that say? So 56 is on which disk? It's disk zero. So what we're going to see is we're going to see that that gets read. And there we are. All right, so we didn't see, learn too much from that extremely simple simulation. So let's look at something that's more interesting. Second one. Okay, now we're doing a bunch of operations. Striping all reads. Let's start this. Okay, so what is this really emphasizing? 
So the point is that all of those disks are operating in parallel for us, right? So we're getting n times the bandwidth of a single system. We have n random operations that are all working in parallel. So that's really quite beautiful. That's why we love RAID, that we are getting all of those operations working. Um, working. And then that's, I think I have one more. What is this one doing? I think it's just doing the same thing but writes. So what do you know? Reads and writes on RAID level zero operate exactly the same. It doesn't matter if we're reading or writing. Uh, we just do a seek, wait for the rotation, do the read or write, and we're done. Okay. So any questions about how that is working with RAID level zero for operations? Okay. Well then, let's do some analysis. So we want to figure out uh, if, I, if you know these parameters, given that we're doing RAID level zero, we want to be able to evaluate all of these different RAID levels and see that there's never going to be one best RAID level. There's going to be some that are better for different metrics, and there's going to be some that are better for different workloads. So with RAID level zero, uh, what's the capacity of that system, given these variables? Mumble it out for me. So C is the capacity of one disk. We have N disks, and so it's simply going to be N times C. All right, this is going to be simple math. How many disks can fail without us losing any data? Zero. If a disk fails, we don't have any redundancy, and we will lose the data that was on there. Uh, what's the latency of a read or write, given the numbers I gave down here? It's just D because we're not doing anything different. A single operation takes just as much latency or time that we have to wait for it as it would have with a single disk. But throughput, that's a little bit more interesting. That's where I was showing you that we really have all N disks doing the work for us in terms of throughput. They were all operating in parallel. So the throughput with a RAID 0 is going to be for sequential accesses, it will be n times the sequential bandwidth of one disk. Like one disk could do 100 megabytes per second. If we have six disks, we'll get 600 megabytes per second up to some other bandwidth limits of other buses. Um, random IO, we'll just get n times that random uh, bandwidth. So this is a really big win. So that's great. All right. Any questions about RAID level zero? Okay. So let's move on to the next system. So what we want to fix is the fact that if we lost any disks, we would lose some data. And maybe the, disks that, the disk that fails, it could have been the one that holds our root directory or includes the super block for the file system or holds some really essential information for the file system. And our file system is not going to work at all if that one key disk fails. Right, so this is certainly the peak random bandwidth that we could get, assuming this perfectly load balanced system where all of the requests go evenly across all of the different disks. Um, I think probability there's going to be some tail, or you can figure out you know, what's, what's the load imbalance to expect for different distributions of requests. But it would certainly be very odd for them to all go to one request. There will be some that have more load to uh, manage than other disks, but if it's truly a random workload, it'll be pretty evenly distributed. All right. Okay, so we want to fix this problem of we can only, we can't handle any disks failing. So that's what RAID 1 is going to do. So again, it's the same interface that the file system is going to see. It's going to think it has a disk of size four blocks, and then we are going to just simply replicate those four blocks across both disks. So here, the uh, logical disk size that's being exported to the file system is exactly the same as the physical disk that each one actually has. We just have two copies of it. Um, so it turns out people usually combine mirroring and striping. So mirroring is RAID 1, striping was RAID 0. Sometimes you'll see this RAID 10, which is really 1 and 0, that we're doing both mirroring and striping. 
So with two discs, we can just do pure mirroring. With four discs, we can do a combination of striping and mirroring, which is what lots of systems are going to do. So we, we stripe across these two groups where we alternate between zero and one and two and three and four, et cetera, but then we replicate block zero across these two discs in that group there. So for short hand notation, I'll just refer this usually to RAID 1 with striping, but if we have more than one, sorry, <laughs> RAID 1, which is mirroring, uh, but if we have more than two disks, we'll also be doing striping with that as well. All right, any questions about what that looks like? Okay, so now that we have RAID level 1 and mirroring, how many disks could now fail without losing any data? So the first thing you need to think about is what's the failure model here? So there's one way that these disks could fail that would be a nightmare for us. It could be that they fail by giving us the wrong data back. So that's what happens with like latent sector errors and happens with a lot of kind of disk corruption that can happen. And so if we did that, then maybe we'd have to read both blocks and see if they're the same, and only if they're the same, then do we trust it. But that's not the model we're going to have for how disks fail. The model that we're going to assume for disk is that they're fail stop, which means they just completely die and completely stop working, and they don't give us any data, and they notify us, or we are able to easily figure out that they're not working. And so they don't continue to corrupt data or do anything bad. They just stop and notify us of this. And so um, this is going to make our life a lot, lot easier. So if we have fail stop disks, then how many disks can we definitely tolerate the failure of? One, and, but it's also possible that we could handle more failures if we got really lucky, right? So it could be that the disk zero dies and disk two dies and we'd be totally fine. We could handle two failures, but if it was disk zero that dies and disk one that dies, then we would lose some of our disk blocks. So in general, we'll say that we can only handle one disk failure with RAID one, but it's possible with some luck that we could actually handle more failures than that. Okay. Oh, more visualizations. Okay. So this is going to be visualizations of RAID level one. Okay, so you'll see we have mirroring and striping, and I think this first workload is going to do reads. Let's see. Yes, it's doing reads. These look like they're random reads. And so they're working beautifully. We're still getting how much bandwidth out of this system? If we have, if R is the random bandwidth of one disk, what's the bandwidth that we got out of that system for these random reads? Let's run it again. <laughs> They're all working very nicely. So we're, all n disks are giving us the r bandwidth. So our total random bandwidth will be n times r in this case, right? All right, so maybe that's obvious. Maybe it will seem less so as we look at other approaches. So I think this next one is going to do writes. Yes, it's doing writes because they're yellow. Writes, we have to keep them in sync, right? We need to update both copies of this block when we change them. So they're behaving nicely in sync. So what's our bandwidth going to be for random writes if R was our random bandwidth? It would be n divided by 2 times R, since we're getting only half of the disk's worth of useful work there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's most likely the case. So we usually in a RAID want to have homogeneous disks where all of the disks in our array all have the same capacity. They're the exact same make and model. They have the same performance. You could try to do something crazy with heterogeneous disks where some perform differently. But certainly, we're going to do the same layout. Like, I don't know of anybody that decides, oh, we should use numbering from the outer tracks to the inner on one of our copies and do the reverse mapping on another one. Yeah, it's 
it's tricky. But you, I mean, you could try to do something like that where you do different layouts that are still easy to calculate mathematically so that you could optimize some seeks. But it, I don't think you're going to end up getting much of a win out of it. But it's a good research question to look into. Yep. More questions about RAID 1, mirroring, random reads, random writes. OK. So that was random. What happens with sequential? which must be number six. Okay, this still looks like it's mirroring. Let's run it. So what happened there? Let us run that again. I think the next one is a slow-mo version of it, I think. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So we're trying to do sequential reads. And so the question is, do we get n times the sequential bandwidth with n disks? So if we're just doing one big sequential read, then we're only going to get n divided by 2 times the sequential bandwidth, right? Because, for example, one disk could, we could have done this a little differently. In this picture, we showed disk 0 read this one, and then disk 1 read this one, and so forth. And we kind of alternated back and forth across them. Um, and it doesn't help this disk at all that it's missing half of the blocks. It takes just as long to kind of skip to the next one as if it had actually done that read. Or another way you could have viewed this is we could have just kept this disk completely idle and this disk completely idle, and then we would have gotten half of the sequential bandwidth out of them as well because only half of the disk would have been doing work. So one of the models is that with sequential reads, with RAID level 1, you're only going to get half the total bandwidth that you could have. Now, I don't always like this model. This is where one of, I disagree with my co-author on kind of what's the best that a, a RAID system could do. So could you imagine a different way that we could have like a sequential workload that has many sequential operations in it, and then we could get the full n times s, the sequential bandwidth of one disk times all n disks. How, how could we get n times s, is my question. But this here, what I see is that, though, you have to do copies mm -hmm. um, of, the, uh, of the block. If I just run one of them, it says everything is run. But here I see. Yeah, but like here we're saying. That's still sequential, and that's the whole point of error. It's just not going to run. Um, so, like, so in this approach here, yeah, like this, like this disk here is only picking up every other one, and then the other disk is picking up the other one. But this, but picking up every other takes just as long as reading every one would have. So with this approach, we only get half the bandwidth. And then the other approach would be we have disk zero read all of the blocks, and disk two read all of its blocks. Um, and then half of the disks are idle. So there were both, with both of those arguments, we're only getting half the possible bandwidth. So my question was, is there a different way to do this to get all of them? And I didn't understand if you were proposing something or not, so I'm going to have someone else. Yeah. 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 That's how I view it, that that could happen too. That we, if you just view, either we have a lot of sequential requests to do, and uh, disk zero and two will do the first one, and then disk two and three will do the next sequential request, and so therefore, and they're all going on simultaneously, we would be getting all of them uh, operating and doing sequential operations. Or if it was just like a really a huge sequential read of the whole disk, then you could divide up that huge sequential read like you were suggesting and give the second half that's still a large amount of data to the first and third disk. And you know it's reading enough sequentially that you are able to amortize that initial seek and rotation to get to the start of that sequential read that you need to do. Yep. So 
either answer ends up being okay. It's all kind of like, well, what is the RAID system really able to do? What is the RAID controller really able to do? What does your workload really look like um, that you're gonna get some slight differences there? So either n divided by two times s or just n times s. Okay, I think that's it. All right, so let's do our analysis. Uh, what's the capacity of our system as a function of c and n? C times n divided by 2. Uh, how many disks can fail in this system? One, maybe more. Uh, what's our latency? It's still just the same. It still takes just as much time to do an individual read or write. Okay, so the interesting other analysis, kind of visualize this layout in your head. What's our steady state throughput for random reads? We decided it was n times r, that all of them are doing work. Requests are going to all of them, evenly, we'll assume. Random writes, the steady state throughput will be n divided by 2 times r, since they both need to do the work for every operation. Sequential writes, uh, they definitely both have to do it. We don't, can't win on that one. Sequential reads, disagreement, maybe it's n divided by 2 times s, but maybe if you have a lot of sequential reads going on, all of the disks can be doing something useful. All right, any questions about RAID level 1? Mirroring. Okay, uh, side issue. So for those of us that uh, really worry about system crashes and power failures and making sure that disks keep all of their data consistent, uh, you can think about what goes on inside of a RAID um, as it does updates. So for example, imagine block two here, we need to write new data to it. So the way that that's going to work is we send that request A to the RAID system and the RAID hardware controller, or this is done in software, it does individual writes to each of those two disks, right? So that worked out great. Keep running along. Then the file system decides it wants to write the value t to block three. So it does that. But then what could happen is the RAID system could have a crash. There's software running in there. Or we could have a power failure. And it could be the case then that we have different data across these two disks. So that's a pretty bad problem because we saw that we don't, it's not like we check the two values. Sometimes when you read that block, you might read from disk one, sometimes you might read from disk zero, and you'd see different results. So what's the general fix for this? Um, so basically, if you buy a very expensive hardware RAID and you have this all done in hardware, then that usually includes not just you know, a processor to do this work, it'll have some small amount of non-volatile RAM in it, some RAM that stays active even if it loses power. And so basically that RAID will record the operations that it was in the middle of doing before it actually does them. So that RAID will record, oh, I'm writing block T to, or writing T to block three on both of these disks. And then if there's a crash and then it reboots, it can look in that little journal and see, oh, I was in the middle of doing it and I didn't get it done. And so it will replay all of that. Uh, software RAID, if you just try to configure this on your own system, uh, you're not going to have this. And so it's, that's why you didn't pay so much money and you don't get quite the exact same reliability and functionality as if you had bought a hardware device to do all of that for you. But we're going to look at this problem a lot more when we look at just how can file systems in general deal with inconsistency and crashes that occur at bad points. Okay, so we've looked at two RAID systems at this point. One had good capacity but poor reliability. That was RAID level zero. And we looked at one that had poor capacity but good reliability. That was RAID level one. Of course, there must be lots of systems in between these two, so let us look at one, RAID level four. Okay, notice we do not yet have performance on this as one of our metrics. RAID level four is gonna be bad at performance, but it's gonna do well on those other two metrics. Okay, so RAID level four. We're gonna use one disk as a parity disk. That last disk is not going to hold any useful data for the file system. It's just going to have a function of all of the other data. It's gonna contain parity for all of the other data that's associated with a given stripe. So basically, it's going to be a lot like in algebra, where if you have one unknown um, and you had uh, 
n variables n minus 1 are known, you can kind of figure out what that one unknown is. So we're going to treat each stripe as a different like equation, and all of the data within that stripe are the different variables, and so if we lose one of them, we'll be able to recompute it. Okay, so this is what RAID level four would look like with four disks. Of course, you could have an arbitrary number of disks, but the last disk you'll always view as, a, as holding parity. And so the parity is computed over the other blocks within that stripe. So P0 is a function of block 0, 1, and 2. P1 is a function over 3, 4, and 5. And the function that turns out to work really well, that's very simple, fast, easy, uh, symmetric, is uh, an XOR function. And so each of these blocks here will just be a bitwise XOR of the data blocks that are on the other disks. So let's do an example. So this is a, a very weird sector of three bytes instead of 512 bytes. But let's figure out what the parity disk would hold. And I switched this to have five disks. It really can have any number of disks. It doesn't have to be a power of two or any nice number. Five is a totally fine number of disks for a RAID. OK, so what would be the first byte of our parity block over here? It's the XOR of 0, 0, 1, and 1, which is 0. So Think of it as, you know, you, you make it so that we have an even number of ones across all of the, the bits there. So 0, 0, 1, and 1, XORD is 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1. We need another 1 to have an even number of ones. 0, 1, 1, and 1. We need another 1 there to have an even number of ones. So 0, 1, 1 is the XOR over these blocks here. All right, everybody buy that? OK. So what's awesome about this now is let's imagine one of those disks dies. You have no memory. You cannot remember what was on that disk. And now you can use that awesome XOR parity function to calculate what was on this disk. And so the model you really want to think about is disk, zero, disk one died completely. It fail stopped. We get a new disk. We replace it in our system. We go out. We read all of the data on the other disks. And we can recompute what must have been on that disk. And then once that reconstruction is done, the system can continue to run and read from disk one. So that's what's called reconstruction, is you get a new disk and you fill it up with what you're able to compute. So what should disk 1 contain? It's just that XOR function again. So with 0, 1, 1, 0 as the first bit, the first bit of disk 1 must have held a 0. And that's what all the other stuff is too, if you just do that XOR function. All right, so reconstruction with RAID 4 uses XORs. Okay. All right, so there's lots of interesting complications here. So um, let us imagine we had this stripe here, and now we want to overwrite this block here. How are we going to update the parity? So the straightforward way to do that is I know what my new contents are, and I do the XOR just like I showed you with the blocks from those other disks. But what does that require you to do? you have to read all of those other disks to write out the parity. So this is looking really, really uh, costly. It's going to have bad performance. We write out this one. We have to read, 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 and write out a parity. So if we have a lot of disks, that's just going to get worse and worse as an approach. If we change one block, we have to read from all of the other disks. So another way to do this is to look at what changed in the block from the old copy to the new copy, and then change those same bits in the parity from the old to the new. So for example, so what we're going to do here then is when disk 0, if we're changing this from a 0, 1, 0 to a 0, 1, 1, for example, that's what we want to write out, we would compare 0, 1, 0 and 0, 1, 1. We'd see that the first two bits are the same, so therefore the two, first two bits of the parity must be the same. The last bit of the data changed, so the last bit of the parity changed. So that's kind of neat, that just by looking to see what changes, you can then figure out what must also change in the parity, and you don't have to look and see what was on all of those other disks. So this can really be a good performance optimization 
uh, when you have a lot of disks that you don't have to read all of those other ones. So that's what I wrote out here. Um, you just read the old value of the data that's changing, you read the old value of the parity, and then uh, we look to see what changed here, zero changed to one, so this bit of the parity must change to one as well. One is the new value, one was the old value, so that doesn't change, well, one was the old parity, so that must also be one in the new parity. Okay, so that's another way of updating parity with RAID 4 or RAID 5, we'll see. Um, and it has much different performance characteristics, so instead of having to read all of the blocks, what you're now doing is you're doing two reads for every write plus two writes, right? So um, we have to read the old parity, write the new parity, read the old data, and write the new data. So every time we want to write one data block, we're now doing four operations. So this is sounding not the best. It's going to have some performance problems. Okay, so let's look at these. So this is RAID 4, and so you'll see we have four disks, the data is being striped across three of them, and then a parity block is on the last disk. And we're trying to do a bunch of, it looks like, reads. So reads are great. Reads aren't the worst thing in the world. These are random reads. How much bandwidth are we getting out of our RAID 4 system? It's n minus 1, the number of data disks, times the random bandwidth, right? that all of those data disks are able to do the good random work. So that's great. Reads are good. Let's look, though, at something else. Let's see what this one's going to do. This is doing writes. Oh, that one wasn't too bad either. What did that do? This one is doing sequential writes. So sequential writes are also pretty good because we're able to, you know, we have this big sequential write in memory. And you know, you're able to then compute, be able to compute the parity blocks for each of those. Doing that parity computation in memory is much faster than writing to disk. So the limiting factor in our system is doing the disk writes, not doing the parity computations. So this is going to end up performing uh, just like n minus 1 times s, that each of the data blocks is able to do their useful sequential work. And the parity disk keeps up with that and writes out the parity information. OK. So that one looked good, too. I think then they start to not look so good. So what in the world is going on now, right? It's doing writes. And to do a write, it needs to read the old block, read the old parity, write the new parity. And it seems to be going very slowly, but it's hard to really see why. But the reason it's doing really badly is because this parity disk has to be involved in every single operation, right? So we are nicely able to do the data reads and writes parallel across these three disks, but the parity disk has to be involved with every single update. So that is the bottleneck of our system. So. Do our analysis real quick. Capacity of RAID 4. What's the useful capacity of this? N minus 1 times C. How many disks can fail? 1. What's the latency? It's D for reads, writes. We're going to have to read and write the parity disk, so it's going to be twice that. Okay, this is the interesting one. So what's the steady state throughput for reads? N minus 1 times S. We saw that. We saw that all of the disks, all the data disks, were able to do their useful work reading sequentially. Writes ended up being the same thing. We calculate the parity in memory. That's fast. And we just have to write out the parity also sequentially to the last disk. And so that last disk is doing work. It doesn't count towards our useful steady state throughput, but it's not slowing us down. Then we saw random reads were also pretty good. N minus one of the disks, all the data disks, were doing useful random work for us. But then it was this horrible case of the random writes where 
all of the operations have to go to that parity disk. We had to read the old parity, write the new parity for every single random write that we wanted to do. So that one disk ends up determining the whole random throughput of our system. So we're getting no benefit out of having more disks. It's not a function of n. And in fact, it's worse random write throughput than if we just had one disk in our system, right? So this is horrible. We cannot use RAID 4. People do not use RAID 4 for this reason. OK, any questions about RAID 4? Yeah? Could you say that a lot louder? Oh, so this is, OK, so for every random write, we have to read the old data and write the old data. That's fine. But we also had to read the old parity and write the new parity. We were doing that differential approach to do that. So every write now does two operations on the parity disk. And so it's able to only then do half of the operations. Though I think you could complain about the model if we wanted to get into details, but the, it's basically it has to do twice as much work in the random operations, so we'll call that one half R. Yeah. Why isn't it R divided by four? So all of those other disks are doing operations, but they're not our bottleneck. So the parity disk is the bottleneck. That's determining the throughput of our system. And we're, spent, we're sending twice as many operations to that parity disk as we had original operations. So it doesn't matter that the data disks are doing stuff. The parity disk has to do a read and a write. So that's why we're doing twice as many operations, so we'll get half the band, useful bandwidth. Oops. Um, so it was based on that we're having to do this for every time we do a update. So we're trying to do all of these random writes. And this is our parity disk. And now when we wanted to modify this, the approach was we have to read the old value and write the new one. We know that. So a bunch of random writes are occurring. And most of they're all going to different disks for doing this part, for reading the data and updating the data. That's fine. But the problem is each one of these causes you know, a read of the old parity and a write of the new parity for every one of those. So the parity disk becomes the bottleneck of the system. It's determining how many operations you can do per second. It's all about the parity disk. Everything's going there. We're doing twice as many operations. We're doing a read and a write for every one random write that the file system wanted to do. So since we're doing two twice as many operations on that parity disk, we can only get like half the useful bandwidth out of the system. If this parity disk was just a normal disk and it was able to do R operations per second, now it can only do half of those since half of them are wasted. Great, so it is, yeah, I will all, we're assuming we're constantly giving the RAID system random writes. There's no empty idle time to kind of do other operations. So this is just completely the bottleneck. And that's, yeah, you have to wait until that parity gets updated, essentially. Yeah. All right, okay. Now the solution. Okay. So with RAID 4, the bottleneck was the parity disk. So the observation is we need to put the parity on a different disk for every stripe. So now we still have five disks, but instead of disk 4 being devoted to parity, we kind of rotate around which disk is responsible for the parity for every stripe. Otherwise, it ex acts exactly the same as RAID 4. So that's pretty neat. OK, so there's a bunch of different ways you can allocate logical blocks down to disks and offsets. Um, this particular mapping is what's called left symmetric, and it turns out to be 
clever and to work very well. Because if I were doing this and I didn't think about how to lay out um, blocks, I would say yes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, parity. But then I probably would have said 4, 5, 6, parity 7, and just kind of always started over at disk 0 with my numbering. Turns out that's not the way to do it. And so what makes a lot more sense is if you think about what, how you want a sequential read to operate. With my bad mapping, I would have read 0, 1, 2, 3, and then come over here for 4. Now for my nice sequential operation, disk 0 had to do twice as much work as everybody else, and I wouldn't get the peak bandwidth out of my system. But with this left symmetric mapping, now when I do a sequential read, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, every disk is involved in that, and we can get the peak bandwidth. Every disk is doing something useful for us. So where is block 8 going to go with this? 8 had better go to D3 so that when we read 5, 6, 7, 8, all the disks will remain active. So that's kind of why we just kind of keep wrapping around. Certainly the parity keeps sliding over to new disks, but you also just have to watch a little bit where those data blocks should go so that you can also be getting peak sequential bandwidth. And then this pattern just keeps repeating over and over again. So P5 would be back over on D4. So this is left symmetric. It's a very good layout for getting good sequential bandwidth out of your RAID 5 system. So any questions about that mapping? OK. All right, so let's do the easy analysis first. What's the capacity of this system? C times n minus 1. How many disks can fail? 1. What's our latency? Still the same thing as before. So a lot of it looks the same as RAID 4, except for performance. So let us look at some more simulations. OK, this is RAID 5. Does it use left symmetric? I can't read. No. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, the simulation does not do the awesome left symmetric, does it? Yes, it does. I can't read anything. No, it doesn't. Zero, one, two, three should be over here. But in this simulator, three is over there. Oh, well. OK. But it still performs pretty similar. So let us look at we're updating 31 and 36. Start this. And what did that do? It was doing two writes, great. So it had to then update 31's parity. It also updated this block here. 36 is here, and it also had to update its parity, which is over there. So it was able to do two operations with writes completely in parallel. There was no one disk that was acting as a bottleneck that had to do all of the parity operations. So again, if we were modifying, if we were writing to this block here, we're also going to be modifying the corresponding parity. And when we are modifying this data block here, we are also modifying the corresponding parity that was part of that strike. OK. So those were a few writes. What is this one doing? These look like reads. OK, reads look pretty beautiful. Reads are scattered everywhere. All of the disks are now able to be utilized. It's not like one of the parity disks is wasted. So that fixed one of the problems of write 4. And then the last problem, 13. What is this one going to do? It looks like they're doing writes. It's doing a lot of them. And the point of this is just to show faster than you can really follow is that all of the disks are occupied. One of them is not acting as a bottleneck. They're all doing updates to parity. They're all doing useful. Um, data operations as well. So the odds of you having to do a parity calculation are that you're, you know, you'll do one in four of them. Okay. All right. So this is what we saw was the performance of RAID 4. Let's see how it compares now for RAID 5. So sequential reads, it was n minus 1 times the s for RAID 4. What will it be for RAID 5? With left symmetric. Oh, is it still n minus 1? Hmm. I guess it is, because you're having to, you're, you're losing out of some useful data. 
Okay, so basically you're stuck reading some parity blocks which aren't useful, so that corresponds to the amount of wasted data. Uh, sequential writes, um, when you do a sequential write, it's just like the previous case where you calculate the parity in memory and then you just write out that whole thing. So that's how much useful uh, writing you're able to do is n minus one. Random reads, all n of the disks are doing read operations, a tiny bit better than RAID 4. But then the big win is for random writes, since not all of the writes and reads have to go to a parity disk, since those operations are scattered around, it's now the case that um, you get n times r divided by 4. And the reason it's that factor of 4 is because every write operation now magnifies into four operations, right? We have to do not just the write of the data, but we have to read the old data, then write the data, read the old parity, write the new parity. So it's four operations for every one, so therefore our bandwidth will be a factor of four less than it could have been, than the peak random bandwidth of one disk. All right, so you should be able to understand how RAID works. Uh, you know, basically what those different layouts are and to be able to understand why we're getting each of these uh, formulas here. Uh, you might hear about other RAID levels. There are things like six, and basically they are things we are not going to cover in this class, but they can handle more than one disk failure. So think about how would you handle more than one disk failure. Basically, you have to add in more parity blocks. So they have parity that's calculated in uh, other ways across other groups of blocks than just a stripe. Okay, so last concluding points, because we still have three and a half minutes. Uh, the takeaway from this is that there is no one best RAID level, right? So if you look just in terms of reliability and capacity, if you don't care about reliability, then you're gonna get the best capacity out of RAID zero, simple striping, right? So if all you care about is capacity, go with RAID zero. Latencies aren't too interesting. Compare performance of RAID 5 and 4. 4 is never a win, so remove RAID 4 from our consideration. But now, now look at performance. So if you know what type of workload you have, you should use a different type of RAID level accordingly. So for example, if you know you're running a database workload that does lots of small uh, writes, what are you going to want to do? So in that case, with lots of small writes, and if you don't care about... Um, Oh, random writes, sorry. Uh, if you don't care about reliability, then go with RAID 0. If you do care about reliability and you really need to get the best write performance possible and you're able to pay for it, if you can pay for more disks, then you should go with mirroring or RAID 1. Don't go with RAID 5. But if you kind of want cost performance, if you don't want to have to buy double as many disks, you just want to buy one extra disk, then RAID 5 ends up working as a good compromise across a wide range of different workloads there. You get pretty good sequential read and write performance, pretty good random read and write performance. So RAID 5 is a very popular approach. Okay, so again, RAID is, works very well in systems. It's very deployable because of the fact that it just exports that block-based interface that looks just the same as a, any block-based device out there, that it has the same interface as a disk. The file system can't tell if it's running on a single disk or if it's running on a RAID system that exports that same block-level in, uh, uh, interface. Um, different RAID levels work better for different workloads. And then what we're going to see is really you could build a RAID on top of any storage device. We've only talked about hard disks at this point, so we are imagining hard disks as the components of our RAID. But next lecture, we'll talk about solid state drives or flash, and you could use those devices in a RAID as well, since they all just export a block interface up the stack. So next lecture, we'll talk about flash, and uh, see you all tomorrow night for your midterm. Hello.